controversies, lots of controversies, confusions, and concerns have risen over the past two years regarding COVID-19 and its vaccination. To answer these confusions, concerns, and myths, the Beacon House school system has arranged this exciting session with all these esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, we, on behalf of the Beacon House, the organizer of School of Tomorrow events, I would like to welcome all of you, the audience who are looking uh, and listening to us. Alikom, I think Dr. Salat has a little bit of an issue with the um, with his audio. Uh, we'll just uh, give him a second to, uh, <laughs> to 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 get this sorted. Uh, as you know, internet is is always a little bit of a tricky um, situation. But um, uh, until Dr. Salat gets this uh, hooked up, I'll um, just sort of give all the give all of us a chance to introduce ourselves, um, and we'll start with. Um, the way that things are arranged in my screen. So, Dr. Farheen, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Farheen Ali. I'm an infectious diseases physician. Um, I am currently associated with the National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases as a consultant in infectious diseases. Um, Dr. Bushra? So, um... I'm uh, Bushra Jamil. I'm a professor of infectious diseases and internal medicine at the Aga Khan University. And I'm currently affiliated with the uh, Isolation Hospital and Infection Treatment Center in Islamabad. And I'm also currently working with the uh, Ministry of Health in Islamabad and helping with the, them with guidelines and um, part of NCOC. And Dr. Umar. And Dr. Umar. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Umar Tukhtai. And uh, I'm a pathologist, and uh, I work at Tukhtai Lab, and uh, we are involved primarily in the diagnostics of COVID and and the supporting investigations around COVID for monitoring of patients. Okay. So, and I'll guess. I guess I'll introduce myself. Also, my name is Dr. Fasma Mahmood. I'm an infectious disease um, a consultant, head of infectious disease at AKU, and. Um, I've worked with um, also the provincial government and a little bit with the uh, federal government uh, again on the on the vaccine. So, so I think the the selection of us four um, is mainly uh, just to give you a good landscape of people involved in uh, the vaccines. Oh, and I see Dr. Salat is back, um, and we'll ask Dr. Salat to take over. Okay. So thank done. you. Can you guys hear me very well? So sorry, so there was some issue with the internet. Uh, uh, so you have already been introduced with uh, Dr. Farin Ali. She's heading the uh, the infectious disease department at NICVD. Uh, Umar Chukhtai is heading the Chukhtai Labs. Dr. Bushra Jamil is. Uh oh. So I guess we need to add a fourth C to this uh, concerns, and that would be connectivity. <laughs> um, so, so all right. So, um, so I think uh, until uh, Saurav comes back, I I was just saying that you know um, between the four of us, uh, we we are in a public sector hospital, a private hospital. Um, Dr. Bushra from uh, the federal government and uh, Dr. Umar Chuktai from uh, the, the lab standpoint. So I think uh, let's start with Dr. Bushra. I didn't know I was going to take over, so we'll make this as a conversation. But Dr. Bushra, um, sitting at the national level, um, can you give us some insight uh, of what your thoughts have been on the vaccination process um, in general? Okay, so a number of considerations are um, taken into account whenever a decision to roll out vaccination is made. So it's not as simple as generally uh, people perceive. So the complexities arise starting from which vaccine to choose for our population. And uh, often for a country like Pakistan, it's not a matter of choice, but a matter of what is available 
for our country. So um, we don't, uh, uh, we are not completely in charge of what kind of vaccine or which vaccine we get at what point in time. So the first decision which, which the govern, government had to make was the availability of vaccine and to roll out the vaccines which were available to our people. So the, one, the ones which were easily available were safe and effective and were based on tried and tested methodology and technology were selected first and then prioritizing. You cannot offer vaccine to everyone in the first go. So you have to prioritize people who are at risk. So um, it was actually common sense that healthcare workers were at the most risk because they handle COVID patients day in and day out. And even if they're not working in COVID wards, patients who turn up at the hospitals generally with, with any condition may be harboring the virus itself. So the healthcare workers were offered the vaccine first and the vaccine was the one which was easily available. And since then, um, a number of developments have taken place. So now we have greater availability of many other vaccines. And um, this is not just uh, the availability of something which, is, uh, which the government is getting as a donation. Government has brought stocks of effective vaccines as well. So we have a mixture of uh, vaccines which are considered highly effective and vaccines which are moderately effective. But based on the principle that some, some protection is better than none, any vaccine which was safe and effective was procured and rolled out based on priority groups. So healthcare workers first, then elderly with immunosuppressed conditions, and then uh, the, slowly and gradually it was rolled out for all the age groups, and now it is being offered for children as well. So the decision is not just based on scientific background and potency of the vaccine, but also on what is available, what the country can manage, what the country can store, and what the country can administer. So I think I have, uh, this is what you were asking. Because I think Dr. Saad is back. I think he's stuck again. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Dr. Farin, as an infectious disease specialist, do you think uh, that vaccines are now going to be part of our life forever and ever uh, more? Uh, COVID vaccine, I think. Uh, and, and I do remember um, you were a big vaccine advocate uh, when we used to work together. So what, what are your thoughts? Oh, um, so at least what we can say for the near future. I think uh, we can definitely speak for the near future that the COVID vaccines are here to stay. We need them. Um, they have proven to be our greatest um, asset or our greatest armamentarium against this, uh, this infection. Um, they, they have been developed very, very, um, uh, they, have, they are very effective and they've been developed based on, um, on solid data. Um, they will be, you know, what we do need from them as we go forward in the future would be as, uh, as and when new variants uh, emerge, would the vaccines be able to keep up with these new variants and be able to provide coverage against these new variants. But for the near future, at least, yes, these vaccines are here to stay. So one thing that is asked of me many times uh, is uh, if the vaccines are here to stay, then uh, what about uh, boosters? And does that mean that we need to get more and more boosters over and over again? And I can maybe uh, give some of my thoughts on this. And uh, I would love to hear what our other three panelists um, have to say about this. And I, and, and I think, um, you know, it's not unusual that we revaccinate or give boosters um, uh, depending on how things are changing in the pathogen. And a good example, this is influenza. Um, we mm -hmm. tend to sort of forget that every year we need to get a flu shot. Um, and it may be very likely that in the coming years, we may need to get uh, COVID shots um, every year as the virus changes. Um, I'm not sure if this is always because of the vaccine stop working um, because we've lost immunity, as opposed to uh, the virus changing or the situation changing, making us more at risk of getting the um, infection really. 
Um, uh, and obviously, we also don't know at this point if two doses are enough or do we need three doses. As you know, some vaccines need three doses like hepatitis B and it may be this is a three dose vaccine. Um, uh, but those are sort of my thoughts on, on boosters. I, I thought I'd just uh, bring it in here because it is probably the number one question I get asked three times a day that should I get a booster or not and when should I get a booster? But maybe I, my other guests, whoever uh, wants to chime in, um, would like to chime in on this. Uh, I completely agree, Dr. Passel. I think this is one of the most frequently asked questions these days. Uh, uh, everyone wants to know that booster lagwaiye, na lagwaiye, lagwaiye, to kaun sawara lagwaiye, subah ko lagwaiye, ke shaam ko lagwaiye, kahan se lagwaiye, khali pet lagwaiye, ke khana kha ke jaaye. So, uh, as and that's understandable. There is so much uh, uh, anxiety around COVID and everything related to COVID. So it's understandable, but. Uh, but the simple answer is yes, absolutely. Right now, just uh, Dr. Farheen Nika, uh, COVID is a part of our lives right now. Hopefully, it will not be for the long term. But uh, the time horizon that we look at, you know, for the next six months, a year, maybe two years, it seems like it is going to be a prominent part of our lives. And so, get vaccinated and get a booster shot as and when available, uh, because jitni uh, protection ho, utna better. Um, I think I, I absolutely agree. I think um, uh, uh, this is such a fluid situation. We are still, you know, if you look at it as versus timeline, um, this disease has been around for now almost close to two years, right? Um, it's it's still early when you ever think about any 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 disease, a new infection, a new disease. So the, the data is still coming in. It's still evolving, and we're getting to know more and more um, uh, about this disease. Um, so from where we stand at this point, it seems that. Uh, maybe we will require boosters for a certain population at least. Um, and whether this translates into a more general population where everyone should get it, or as uh, you know, Dr. Fessel was saying, that it's going to be a three-dose vaccine or it's going to be an annual shot that we do as influenza is, for example. Um, this, this, I think, only time will tell. Guys, do you guys hear me now, finally? Yes. So... Uh, I need to ask a question from Faisal. In spite of all the death and morbidity of countries, rich countries to make money, why was that? So, so saw your question cut off in the middle. All I heard was death and morbidity. Um, so all the death and, and, and morbidity that we have seen, why do people in the world, especially in Pakistan, still feel that this was just a hoax? There's no coronavirus. It was just invented to make money by the rich countries to make vaccines and stuff. Is that, that's a controversial myth plays around in people's minds, especially in Pakistan. That's a, that's a, that's a really good uh, question and, and, and perhaps better uh, addressed to somebody who doesn't believe in COVID, but I can tell you, um, uh, based on what I've, I've, I've sort of spoken to people, uh, th there are a couple of things here. Uh, first is um, social media has played a huge part um, in, in, in not just this controversy, but other controversies and, and, and in um, uh, conspiracy theories. Um, and, and it's always uh, nice for human nature and it's always nice for us to sort of blame some, somebody else or, or not believe in what, what is actually happening. Um, I think this was really a much bigger issue earlier on um, uh, in the COVID uh, pandemic when a lot of people had not seen other people die. But, you know, at this point, um, it's less of a concern, um, I think, because everybody knows somebody who's either been afflicted or died or heard of somebody who's died. Um, so it's become really on the forefront. There are still people who believe that this may be a controversy. This, there are people who believe um, that uh, this could be because of, uh, you know, the vaccine is not real. And, and I would really urge everybody, um, especially people who've, who've been following this, um, is that if somebody brings this up, make sure you sort of talk to them. And if you've ever received a video on WhatsApp or, or, or you've seen one on YouTube or any of the, the social media platforms, and it, it, it goes contrary to what other people are saying, then try and verify it. Um, and at least if you can't verify it, don't spread it, don't send it out to other people, because we're as much a part of misinformation um, uh, if, you, if you're doing this. Fair enough. Omar, uh, people believe that the researchers have rushed into development of COVID-19 vaccine. It used to take 30 years, 40 years. How is it possible that people have come up with a vaccine within a span of one year? Look at Moderna and Pfizer. Billions. Yeah. 
So they also again believe that this is a this is a this is a controversial thing, that these vaccines are a hoax. Uh, we can fly faster uh, for less than ever before. We can go into space and reuse rockets now. We can. Uh, our cell phones have the computing power that. 20 years ago, only the most expensive uh, uh, mainframe computers used to have. So to say that vaccine development or medicine development should be stagnant and should be frozen in time as far as uh, development and safety uh, studies are concerned, it's, it's, not, uh, it's disingenuous. Of course, some things cannot be replaced. For example, if you want to do a a three-year, five-year surveillance program to see KCBG's long-term effects, that time cannot be accelerated. But based on the best current evidence, all of the vaccines that are in use right now are very safe and uh, to, effective to various levels of acceptability. So, uh, and remember that this is, this is akin to a wartime situation. The pandemic has impacted every aspect of our daily lives across the world. So Iskander, sometimes you have to trade off a little bit of uh, certainty for uh, for a little bit of expediency. And I think uh, Iskander, we, some judgment calls have been made, but on the whole, I think uh, the safety data seems to be panning out and uh, the, the effectiveness seems to be panning out. So I, 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 I truly believe, uh, you know, I, I think we did a similar session last year. I truly believe that we don't have to do this session again next year. At least we don't have to do this session on the same topic next year. Because a year ago, it was understandable that vaccines are fast track. At this point in time, millions and millions of Pakistanis and more than billions of people around the world have been vaccinated. And you know their, their lives are starting to come back to normal. So I think this question is a little bit, a little bit like beating a dead horse kafi ho gayi hai you know accept karne is reality ko ke covid tha covid hai or covid protection primarily revolves around vaccination and uh jin logo ne lagwai hai they are very safe uh, much safer than people who have not been vaccinated so uh, i think it's time to kind of accept that fact and move on to more interesting uh, Fair discussion enough. well said uh, Farheen, uh, people say that I already had COVID-19. Why should I take a vaccine? I am already uh, immunized because I already got the COVID-19. Is that true? Um, so could I just uh, take a, a quick uh, um, this thing and answer, put a couple of points to your last question first, and I can answer this question if that's okay. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So I think because this whole concern, uh, it's absolutely true that um, you know everyone's very concerned about the fact that this vaccine came in so much earlier. But there were several things that actually also was um, uh, that that helped this. Uh, first of, obviously, the biggest impetus was that it was the outbreak itself, the pandemic itself. It, it made everyone realize that you know there has to be a massive focus um, on a kind of preventive measure like a vaccine. Everyone's concerned about the the general feeling about a messenger RNA platform, you know, for the delivery of the vaccine. But messenger RNA, uh, the platform itself, it's not new. It, meaning, it was already under investigation for other vaccines like the Ebola vaccine. It's also under investigation for a form of influenza vaccine for other kinds of therapies. So the platform is not new either. Um, so, you know, to develop something uh, was not going to be as difficult um, as it would have been for a completely, completely new vaccine. Um, the other thing was that in this, uh, because of the impetus of, um, uh, of uh, COVID, the, but the, of the, which uh, COVID put on the healthcare system, um, the vaccine production actually began uh, before uh, the vaccine uh, completed all its uh, uh, approval process. The process for review was just the same. It goes through your phase one, phase two, phase three trials, all the safety trials, everything was done. But the vaccine went into production pending approval. So the minute uh, the vaccine received approval, it could be you know, um, uh, you know, released for use uh, for the general public. So that I think also sped up the process between the time that the vaccines were first, um, you know, talked about and, and delivered. Um, your question about the fact that um, you know that we, uh, if someone's gotten uh, COVID, why get vaccinated again? Um, well, it seems that having uh, um, you know COVID does not always produce a robust immune response. 
and that the immune response may wane uh, with time. Um, so the vaccine, it would still be indicated to help, you know, sort of boost up that, that uh, uh, immune response uh, to help prevent us uh, getting COVID again. So that that's makes perfect sense. So one should get vaccinated no matter whether you have got COVID-19 or not. Bushra, if people also believe, and this is again a, a, a myth, that getting the COVID-19 vaccination gives you actually COVID. So what do you say about that? To those people uh, none of the currently available vaccines uh, are based on live viral vector so we have either inactivated vaccines or component vaccines like peptides or mrna based vaccines so it is impossible it's not nearly impossible it is it is impossible to get actual active infection from vaccine it's not one just and should not be worried about getting COVID just because of the vaccine. Vessel, some people also say that the side effects of COVID-19 vaccination are severe, and that's why one should not get vaccinated. And since I've already, and there is another part to it, that not only they are dangerous, even if I get the vaccination, then people say that I should continue wearing the masks and I should continue taking the precautions. If I have to be first, it's so dangerous to get the vaccine, and then once I take it, why do I have to take precautions? Vassal, what do you say about that? So I say um, the example is if you're driving and you wear a seatbelt. Um, uh, if I'm going to get wearing a seatbelt and if I get in a car accident, um, then I could still get very hurt and the seatbelt's uh, uncomfortable. You know, the thing is with the vaccine um, is that there are side effects. They're not any major side effects. It's not a dangerous a medicine. Millions and millions of people have not gotten it. Um, uh, and we haven't seen any major horribly uh, side effects. Um, no drug is 100% safe. Uh, there are some very, very, very rare um, uh, side effects we're seeing, but nothing that's completely unmanageable and people that nothing that we don't recognize um, so far. On the other hand, uh, we do know that after the vaccine, the risk of dying, the risk of getting admitted um, is extremely low, um, extremely, extremely low. Um, uh, and so when you look at the risk and the benefit, the risk of, of, of this really main, minor side effect versus the risk of dying of COVID um, or even worse, spreading, the COVID, spreading COVID to other people, um, uh, you know, the risk benefit is clearly in the fact that you need to get the vaccine. Um, and the mask um, uh, needs to stay on for now, at least, um, until more people get vaccinated. Thank you, Faisal. And uh, if you guys are just joining in, thank you for joining us at the Beacon House School Systems SOT events. Uh, so we have these panelists, Bushra Jamil, Faisal Mahmood, Fareen Ali, and Umar Chukhtai. My name is Salat Fatmi, and we are conducting this session to, uh, to promote awareness uh, about vaccination, COVID-19, and to, uh, to, to, to take away those confusions about those myths and controversies. I have a question for Omar, and it's a pretty interesting question. People say that when you take the messenger RNA vaccination, it enters your own DNA, and it changes the DNA of human beings. Is that true? No. Omar? I I said no. And I, I think, I think, if you stop here, then you will stop here. It's simply not true it's not true so it's it doesn't make sense the messenger rna vaccine cannot enter human dna but that's that's something people have uh, questioned uh, all this time um Fessel, people ask uh, one of the very common things that are apparent uh, all over the world especially in pakistan that covid-19 vaccine as soon as you get it it leads to male or female infertility is that true another one no <laughs> there, there is absolutely no um, justification when they come up with these questions and answers about the fertility of human beings what, what do you have to say to them that there is actually no scientific data um uh, to support uh, infertility it doesn't make any sense of how this would um, happen to begin with and this is a very old controversy not just with this vaccine but with other vaccines also um the same thing happened uh, with the polio vaccine if you remember where the same um, uh, sort of concern was that this is called, going to cause infertility. It's a very, very common uh, way of people scaring um, and, uh, or anti-vaxxers scaring people in not getting the vaccine. Thank you. So everybody has heard uh, Faisal Mahmood, who is uh, 
Tamra Imtiaz, a COVID-19 expert. He has said that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is no scientific proof that people will get infertile because they will get vaccinated. So one should get vaccinated. Bushra, what do you say to those people who say that COVID-19 only affects elderly and old people? It doesn't affect children and young adults. Is that true? Uh, that's incorrect. So like any infection, uh, the virus does not discrim discriminate who to infect and who not to infect. The problem with elderly is that they tend to get more severe disease. So infection can, anyone can get because it's there in, uh, in the environment and it is transmitted from person to person. So in a household of uh, where you have children, young adults and elderly, children and young adults may get away with having just mild symptoms. But it's the elderly who may require hospitalization and they may go on to develop severe complications. So infection, the risk of infection for everyone is there, but the risk of severe disease differs and it varies. It increases with increasing age and with the presence of other conditions like diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, chronic liver disease. So any chronic condition um, makes you more vulnerable to develop symptomatic disease and uh, with more complications. That's that, that makes that makes. Uh, uh, or Faisal? Anyone wants to comment on the same uh, question? Why do we have? Why do people still believe that it only affects the old people? The children don't get affected. I, so I think uh, I'll ask. I'll let let, Bush, uh, let uh, sorry, Farheen um, answer also. But just uh, just uh, one uh, one reason could be also is that uh, the elderly are the ones that you see dying and the elderly are the ones who get the most severe disease and they're the ones who come and notice more um, when a young person gets the infection they may have minimal or or almost no symptoms um, and they don't really realize um, that they're sick uh, while the elderly are the ones who succumb and go to the hospital so on the face of it um, uh, if you're just looking at at sort of the symptoms and numbers, it looks like elderly are infected uh, more. But uh, I, I would like Farheen to sort of answer. Um, I would, yeah, I, I would agree with that, actually. Um, and uh, and just sort of, you know, um, elaborating on that a little bit would also be for the fact that then the young actually don't go and get tested. So, um, you know, they, they may have the symptoms, they have the mild symptoms. Um, it's just a, you know, a so-called, if I can use the late term, flu. And um, you know, they a day or two, and they don't get themselves tested. So we don't capture that data, that how many of the of the young population are actually infected. It's not until you were sick enough to get tested that you got tested. So those who were sick enough were usually ends up being those who either have the comorbid conditions that Dr. Pusher was talking about, you know, that heart disease or the lung disease, um, and so on, or the elderly. Makes sense. So, uh, Farheen, I, I, I will continue with you and uh, uh, ask you this, that a lot of people, even the physicians uh, all over the world, they feel that once you acquire coronavirus, you never recover. It stays inside your body and it has it is slowly and gradually destroys your lungs and the rest of the body and you remain sick for life. Is that is that something which is true or totally untrue? So here I would give a yes and no answer. <laughs> so um, so the, the, let me do the no part first. Uh, the no part is that uh, um, no, that the virus does not remain um, in the system. Um, once a virus comes in, it causes uh, your, your COVID disease that, you know, which is the disease itself with the fevers and so on, the COVID pneumonia, if you do get it. Um, and then the virus is gone. Right. Um, so it doesn't remain in the system to actually, um, uh, you know, cause uh, continuing lung destruction and so on. Yes, if the lungs were very severely affected um, in the initial disease when you had the COVID pneumonia, then yes, you can end up uh, with destroyed lungs and lung fibrosis, uh, which would then obviously impact the quality of life as you go uh, as you go in the future. Uh, but that is similar to any pneumonia um, if severe enough. Right. Um, but the yes part of it, why um, I was there, that we do understand that um, there is a, a, a certain proportion of people who continue to have some very vague symptoms post-COVID. 
and uh, that has been put under you know this uh, a banner of being called long COVID. It doesn't mean that the virus is still there. They are not infective. They can't transmit the virus to anybody. Um, but there is some kind of an activation, maybe, of the immune system in them that results in these uh, symptoms of, uh, of um, uh, uh, you know, not very clear cut, but vague symptoms of, for example, um, fatigue, um, you know, body aches, um, uh, some uh, confusion, uh, you know, mood disorders, um, things like that. Uh, so in that regard, can if you say that can COVID have long term symptoms? Absolutely. Uh, in a certain proportion of patients. But the virus itself does not remain um, in the system. Very true. So uh, viewers, uh, you have understood that it can affect everyone, elderly and children. And it do, you do recover from Corona. So don't uh, feel bad if you get it. Get yourself uh, being seen and uh, continue with whatever you do. So Omar, I always have interesting questions for you. One of the interesting questions is about the mutants of viruses. So people have this thing in their mind that these Lambda, Alpha, all kinds of variants, Delta variants have been created in the lab from the virus or they have just come in into play to continue to make money. What do you say about that? These mutants have come automatically or they have been created? Uh, of course, just like the original virus, uh, the mutations also have happened uh, because not enough people are vaccinated. So not enough the virus uh, divide karta hai, to wo apni kitab nahi padta, or uh, apni marzi se divide karta hai, or kabi kabar uske the mutants nikal aate hain jo ke phir, uh, unka jo survival advantage hota hai, to phir zyada grow kar, ja, kar jate hain. Ye jin, jin uh, mutants ki hum baat kar rahe hain, variants ki hum baat kar rahe hain, ye to sirf chand hain. बहुत सारे वेरिएंट्स हैं लेकिन वेरिएंट्स ऑफ कंसर्न वो हैं जिनके अंदर जो वेरिएशन हुई तो उसकी वजह से वो ज्यादा इंफेक्शियस हो गए ज्यादा कंटेजियस हो गए अगर हम एक मिनट के लिए अगर सीरियस बात कर लें तो बात ये है कि एक ऐसी बीमारी है जो कि शुरू हुई दुनिया में एक होने से और पूरी दुनिया को उसने अपनी लपेट में ले लिया एंड इट इज नॉट गोइंग टू गो अवे until enough people are vaccinated and uh, and that's simply the way out uh, thankfully we live in a in a world in 2021 which as opposed to 1919 1920 we are able to vaccinate millions and millions hundreds of millions of people very quickly so on the individual level and and in many cases on the national level the uh, the world, the, those countries are moving to a world beyond COVID. And we need to think about that in terms of our nation also, that in order to get to a point where we can start to have major gatherings and we can uh, start to be in a situation where we don't have to wear masks, we have to vaccinate enough uh, people within our country. There is no other way out of it. Very well said, Omar. And with 250 million people getting affected, over 5 million dying, this pandemic is far from over. And as Umar has said, the only way out is most of the people get vaccinated. And our country, no matter what we have to criticize about their other policies, but they have done very well in terms of getting us vaccinated with all the economic problems. So we have, uh, I think we should be proud that we are getting vaccinated. Bushra, uh, I have a question for you. Now, a lot of people, a lot of us have got Sinopharms uh, in the beginning, uh, those vaccinations. And now people are saying or, or uh, people are recommending that we should get the booster of Pfizer or Moderna. Is that something which works or is it something just not proven or they, we are just doing it for the hell of it? Uh, no, uh, there is ample scientific evidence that you can mix and match vaccines and the effect is a greater boosting effect so you can this is called heterologous use of uh, vaccines that you the the vaccine you're using for boosting is different from the previous ones which you have received so uh, the platform is different the kind of vaccine you've received first is different now if you use a different vaccine you can expect a better boosting effect and mrna vaccines are good as primary course and as booze. so uh, this is good enough 
but we can also use the same Sinopharm or Sinovac or whichever we've used before. We can use an additional dose of the same vaccine as a booster. So boosting basically means that you are challenging your immune system with the antigen again and just jolting it to mount a stronger response. So uh, there is scientific evidence for benefit of using mRNA vaccine as a but booster, Bush, even if you have pre-posed this question one. and Omar also. People say that the the Sinopharm vaccine was from the attenuated virus. And the Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccine, which are the, the RNA vaccines. So how do you mix and match the attenuated virus with this? There is no, uh, the mechanism of action or the mechanism of the efficacy of producing immunity is totally different. So that controversy is not in just uh, in common people, it's amongst the physicians also. And uh, as you said, I believe in it, but most of the people still don't. Uh, Faisal and Farin, do you want to help uh, your colleague with this? Yeah, yeah I would like, like to explain it further. Yeah. So it's not the mRNA which you want in your body. The mRNA translates into the surface antigen of the virus. And this surface antigen has already been introduced in the form of inactivated virus previously. So mRNA mm -hmm. votes for surface antigen of the virus. So it's not mRNA itself, but what it does in the body. And it Again, jolts the immune system, reminds it that you've been exposed to it before. Now you are re-challenged with it again. So the immune response which kicks in is stronger than the one which was previously developed. That's the science behind it. Yeah, and, and, in Omar, any, yeah. any comments? So, so, so exactly what Dr. Uh, Bushra says, uh, vaccines are not like drugs. They're not like medicines where if I give antibiotic A, uh, then the antibiotic B is different. Um, so it may or not work. Um, or it, It's more what you're doing in the vaccine, as uh, I'm sure most of the listeners know, is that you're tricking the body into assuming that there's a real infection happening. So how do you trick the body? Um, there are many different ways of it. Either you can give the body just a dead vaccine, or you can give the body a part of the vaccine, um, uh, sorry, part of the, 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 the virus, um, or you can give, um, or you can tell the body how to make part of the virus and the body then sort of starts making reaction against it. So, so regardless of how you tell the body, you're just teaching the body how to make antibodies. Um, and the, when you, when you talked about the, the Sinopharm and Sinovac, that's one way to teach. Um, when you talk about the mRNA, that's a different way to, to, to revise. So, so to give you an example from a school, um, you're reading from one book and now you're reading the same subject matter from a different book and you're sort of learning how uh, a new way of learning or, or learning the, the, the same thing again. But there is one other aspect we don't talk about, uh, obviously. So you, you asked that should we get the booster um, or not? And Dr. Busher very rightly pointed out that there is good data on boosting um, uh, in, in that when you give another vaccine, uh, you your antibody levels go up. But keep in mind, there, there are many other dimensions uh, to this as well. So, for example, um, there's still a large population of the, of, the, of, of the country who has not even gotten a single dose of the vaccine. So, so if you make this as a national policy that everybody who's been vaccinated gets another dose now, then that means you're going to take away from that large proportion. Now, obviously, I'm not in a position um, to know the data of how much vaccines are available, how much are coming in, and how, how the vaccine drive is going. Um, on a national um, uh, scale. But that's the reason why um, very often the government will not give you, uh, say that, go ahead and get a booster. The second thing to keep in mind um, is that when you look in the vaccine effectiveness, how well the vaccine works, um, the vaccine may not, it does not really prevent you from getting the infection. Like I had mentioned, it prevents you from getting severe disease. So if you have 10 people who are wearing a mask and 10 people who are not wearing a mask and they're all vaccinated, then obviously the vaccine is going to work less in the people not wearing uh, a mask. So that's not that the vac that your immunity has gone down or the vaccine is, uh, is just the, that, you know, you have more virus coming into you and therefore the vaccine is working less. So, so there are many, many things that go into the decision of if you want to give a booster um, or not. And then the last thing is, um, and then I'll hand off to Farheen, is that it also depends on who you're talking about. So if you're talking about the elderly or the immunocompromised or people who we know get more severe disease and may not respond very well to two doses of vaccines, uh, maybe they do need a third um, uh, dose of the vaccine. So, 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 so there is definitely data that um, giving a third dose or maybe a four dose um, uh, will boost the immunity, but it's not so straightforward and you can't translate this automatically on yourself or myself. That does this mean that I need a second um, or a third uh, dose? Uh, sorry, Dr. Farin, I took too longer than I thought I would. 
Uh, no, I, I guess yeah, I think you've covered it. I absolutely agree. Um, uh, the, the concern remains that uh, until and unless we have a large majority of the population vaccinated, at least for the first, you know, the first and second doses, um, the booster um, is very interesting for and it's, it's important down the line. But it should not, uh, to some extent, take away from the fact that we need to first have everybody, as many people as possible, vaccinated first. Um, then it would be definitely be an important um, asset uh, in patients like Dr. Pessel was saying and Dr. Busha was saying, um, in those whose immunity um, is poor as it is. So again, the elderly, those with comorbids, cancer patients, transplant patients, um, HIV patients. Um, so in, in them, it may actually uh, have a benefit as an additional dose rather than as a booster. So and there is there is one, uh, and this is for all the panelists. There's a uh, there's a question which is even in my mind. Okay, I have studied a lot on this COVID vaccine also over these years, over the last couple of few months, and uh, even that question comes into my mind. Polio vaccines. Once you get the polio vaccine, you can't get polio. But if you get the coronavirus vaccine, you will still be able to get the corona, but it will not be very severe. Is that what it is? Yes. You can still get the coronavirus, but it will not be very severe. Is that the reason to get the corona vaccines? Okay. Absolutely. I would like to take this first. So not all viruses are alike. Not all infections are alike. So you have different kinds of vaccines for different diseases. And for many diseases, the vaccines do not absolutely protect you from getting infected. They decrease your risk of getting infected or getting disease. And for corona, for uh, viruses like the RNA viruses, influenza is the classic example. So for viruses which keep changing, they come up with newer structures, newer antigens. So they have this capacity to escape the immune response. So you need to uh, be in a race with the virus and come up with a vaccine in time to prevent infection from the new strain. So for influenza, there is a new vaccine every year. So if you want to compare COVID vaccines with any of the vaccines previously existing, you compare them with influenza vaccine and not with polio vaccine. Okay. Uh, any other comments on this? I, I completely agree with Dr. Busha that, you know, it's not fair to compare one vaccine from the other. And, you know, uh, with the with our, our, our capacity to cause sterilizing immunity, in other words, immunity that will, uh, will prevent you from getting the infection, but the respiratory viruses has never been um, uh, great. Um, so, so the main reason to give the vaccine really is to prevent severe uh, disease. Um, and you know, there are other vaccine examples too, where even after you get the infection, the, the vaccine, you can still acquire the, the 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 pathogen, but not get sick. Meningococcal vaccine is another one where after the vaccine, you can get that uh, that bacteria still living in your throat, um, but you don't get sick from it. Um, uh, while there are others where you can completely prevent the infection. The hepatitis B vaccine is a good example of that. So, so all these vaccines are different. Um, you can't really compare. Uh, it's really apples and or it's it's not even apples and oranges. It's like uh, carrots and carrots and bananas. Maybe they're really different. <laughs> Omar, no, I think we're uh, we're dealing in a dealing with a virus that continues to change. We were just talking about variants earlier, and so uh, so our protection has to and our expectations of protection have to be uh, modified accordingly. So yes, uh, having the vaccine protects us from severe illness, uh, but uh, because the virus continues to replicate and continues to infect people, usually the virus continues to come up with new variants. And that's why you know the fourth wave was called by the Delta virus. And uh, it caused devastation even uh, and infected many, many uh, breakthrough cases uh, because uh, because the virus was, was essentially a, a much more contagious variant. So this a significant percentage of our population to vaccinate. And I think uh, uh, just to uh, echo something that was said earlier, I think uh, on a national level, a year ago, uh, the outlook for vaccination in Pakistan seemed uh, very bleak. And uh, uh, I, I, everyone 
no matter what their political affiliation, will have to admit that the way the vaccination has been rolled out in our country is exemplary. And, and the way we have encouraged vaccination and discouraged a vaccination-free uh, uh, lifestyle is also exemplary. The way we have made it mandatory for air travel, the way we have made it, made it mandatory for restaurant, indoor dining. Uh, so in essence, uh, without mandating it, we have made it uh, almost mandatory. And uh, you know, or and the, it was a stroke of genius to threaten to cut off the the cell phones. Uske baad to fir line lag gayi thi aur line toot bhi gayi thi. I think we even caused a stampede somewhere. So, but I think uh, the reason that pe people are able to get booster shots right now is because the interest in the number of people who are willing to get vaccinated, uh, uh, most of them have already been vaccinated. Now, the next challenge is to get people who don't want to get vaccinated to get them to be vaccinated because a significant percentage of our population hai, jo either are not aware or don't care or are skeptical about uh, this process. And we have to mount an equally uh, important and equally uh, uh, large uh, information campaign and, and uh, motivational campaign and uh, to make sure that the next 25, 30, 40 percent people uh, get vaccinated, because that's that's our ticket out of this uh, out of this whole episode. So I I would pose an interesting question to uh, all the panelists, and it's uh, it's something that comes in everybody's mind in Pakistan. Are we blessed? Uh, is this something special in Pakistan that we had? that we never got affected by COVID-19 the way the rest of the world did. Because we did nothing right except for a few, uh, few lockdowns and few other things. But if you go out on the street, everybody was mingling with each other without masks, without sanitizers. They were just going up, uh, with their normal activities. Yet, it never got us affected the way it affected, especially the Western nations. So people say that we are blessed. Are we actually blessed or there is something wrong with us? Anyone? Well, if you look at the way we are doing in the World Cup, we are definitely blessed. So, usko to aap ignore nahi kar sakte. So that's, we are uh, blessed. Uh, yes. But but that alone is, uh, you know, Allah Ta'ala kehta, apni madad karo, to main tumhari madad karunga. And I think uh, there are definitely other factors at play. Uh, one thing which was, is also a factor, I'm sure, is that uh, our demographics are different. We have a massive uh, youth population, and uh, we did a study last year to just to look at healthcare workers. This was before vaccinations. This was right after the uh, the first wave, and at that time it was like fifteen thousand people. I, about thirty percent of the uh, of the healthcare workers had already had already had antibodies to to COVID. So you know uh, maybe there has been a massive, uh, much more silent wave of COVID across the younger population also so so what i'm saying is okay we are blessed but blessed in in ways that uh, uh, you know our population is younger and uh, and we are blessed we're definitely blessed in the way we have been able to vaccinate a lot of people very quickly and uh, and then i think uh, uh, I would like to comment on this one because uh, both Faisal and myself have been very closely involved with, with the government and with the, the decision making. And one thing I've been impressed by is the sincerity of purpose and the way the data is collected and reviewed every single day and decisions are made based on what the information is coming to, to, to the center. So data-driven decisions and sincerity of purpose and a concerted effort to control the disease from getting out of hand and then modifying practices. That so much effort has gone into controlling COVID in Pakistan, which many people do not realize at all. But uh, a lot of hard work, sincerity and effort has gone in day in and day out. You. 
so um, I think we have uh, we're having a little connectivity issue. So maybe we can uh, some of the um, audience questions are coming in, um, and uh, maybe we could just start uh, with some of the audience questions uh, till we wait for Dr. Solat. Um, so one of the questions that I see there are that um, uh, can I get a routine vaccine at the same time that I could get a uh, COVID-19 vaccine, um, Dr. Fessel? Oh, um, Dr. Buddha, would you like to take the question? I think Faisal is also having a problem. So there is no problem taking any routine vaccine with COVID-19 vaccine. There is no need to wait for a particular number of days before you get another vaccine or after you've taken a vaccine. And so you don't have to wait for a COVID vaccine. So uh, uh, most of these vaccines can be taken at the same time in the same sitting. So no contraindications for taking these different vaccines together. Absolutely. Um, so another question that's come in, um, uh, I'll take the question is, uh, uh, or Dr. Fessel is back on. Uh, Dr. Fessel, will children five years and above also get the vaccinated soon? Ah, I think we've, uh, we've uh, lost Dr. Fessel. Uh, so as data is, uh, um, so I'll just, uh, I'll just take that question that, um, Obviously, like we began uh, uh, vaccinating the whole vaccination process based on uh, data that was available. Since majority of our first uh, initial data was on adults, vaccines were mainly made for 18 years and above. And that's how it went. Um, gradually, as, as studies have been done in, um, in the younger population, uh, vaccines have now, as you know, been approved for, um, for uh, use in um, or have had approval, uh, emergency use approval taken for in use in 12 and above. And in Pakistan, too, we are beginning uh, and have begun our vaccination of uh, school going kids uh, uh, 12 and above. Um, yeah, in, the data is also now starting to come in regarding vaccines uh, being safe and efficacious for children five years and above. Um, and in, and uh, based on, on that uh, data and looking, uh, look, you know, seeing how good that data is, um, they have actually again asked for approval and received approval for vaccinating children um, in the West, uh, in the United States, for example, for children five years and above. The vaccine is, is slightly different in that it is um, it is a, a half strength vaccine uh, as compared to the vaccine that's been used for older children and adults. Um, and uh, there's a, another slight change in the vaccine as well that helps it to be stored more comfortably at um, at the at, at the you know the, the refrigeration temperatures. But in essence, it's the same vaccine. Um, but uh, but the data is now there that we it can be uh, used in children five and above. We haven't gotten there yet in Pakistan. I think we are right now uh, have an approval for twelve and above. Um, it's actually under discussion, and a lot yeah. of data is coming out on Sinopharm and Sinovac. Uh, uh, they can be safely used in children three and above. So countries like China, Argentina, and uh, Bahrain. A few other countries have actually started role, uh, uh, offering it to very young children. So we are waiting for more data. And uh, these things are under discussion. And uh, soon Pakistan will be rolling out vaccine for younger children as well. So there is one question which, um, uh, Faisal, if you can hear us, how can we convince the parents to get their 12-year-olds and above to get vaccinated? Because that's important to the Beacon House school system and all the schools that we are uh, involved with, all our kids. Uh, so how can we convince our parents uh, in Pakistan to get their kids vaccinated? What should we do? So I think uh, uh, explain to them uh, the fact that schools are open because of the fact that our rates are down and to get them vaccinated means we'll keep the rates down. Also that um, uh, this is a large population of people, of, of kids who are moving around um, mingling uh, now in school and bringing the infection home. Um, so by vaccinating them, they're saving actually their grandparents um, uh, at the same time. Um, uh, and then the vaccine is is, is safe um, in, in this population um, uh, for the future. So, so a couple of things you can tell them. So uh, before we start wrapping up uh, and uh, uh, looking at uh, what we did, Umar, I have the most interesting question for you. Oh, so... No. Some people believe that uh, there is a microchip in the vaccines. And when you vaccinate people, you're actually 
putting those microchips and now one day all the human beings will be monitored what do you say to them there is a microchip but it's not in the vaccine it's in your phone and you are already being monitored so if you don't want to be monitored just log off your android device and log off of okay. facebook and whatsapp and whatever but don't don't blame the vaccine for it so what do you guys say about that a lot of myth especially a lot of people in lower socio economic status in pakistan feel that there is a microchip in this vaccine uh, absolutely absolutely not you know so okay. i think uh, i think this is also uh, what was said earlier in the in the in the program that uh, a lot of the misinformation that's spread by social media is responsible for this and i think yeah. that's where we really we need to step up and and you know um, stop this disinformation so there is no microchip uh, audience if you guys have just logged in we are in the beacon house sot events uh, we are with the uh, with uh, farheen ali umar chuktai busha jamil and fasal mahmood uh, and we are talking about the controversies myths confusions about uh, about covid-19 and its vaccinations so we have talked about a lot of stuff guys we are going to wrap up this session in the next couple of minutes is there any burning question that is coming to any one of you who we want to ask amongst each other otherwise we'll wrap it up farheen umar bushra fasal so so just uh, two really qu uh, quick things um one is that if somebody is um, everybody's at risk of covid regardless of where they are so even if you don't go out uh, much um if you're elderly and you stay home or you're a housewife do get vaccinated because the, the there is no way that unless you're a hermit and never move and see anybody at all ever um you know you you will still get the 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 infection from from different people so everybody needs to to get this done um and then then obviously um we still have a long way to go to vaccinate um and uh the next target really is uh, not our urban centers but our rural ru rural centers and there's a lot of mobile vaccination um uh, that's now on the way um to target that uh, particular area but everybody please get vaccinated and and don't forget the other things that you have to do wearing a mask stay in a ventilated place uh, and stay at least a little bit maintain so maintain a little bit distance from people um i would like to make a comment here so vaccination is one strategy which is helping us move closer to normalcy so most of the npis as they are called are being relaxed in cities where vaccination has exceeded 40% of the total eligible population so the more people there are who are vaccinated the greater the chances that you are able to come to normalcy sooner so if you want to lead a normal life just get vaccinated these vaccines are safe they are effective there is ample data showing their safety and efficacy and the protection has been remarkable there has been a substantial decrease in number of severe disease cases and number of deaths after the roll out uh, vaccination roll out of vaccination program in pakistan and the other thing is for parents who are worried that they will uh, not allow their children to be vaccinated at school they should take the children to the vaccination centers and get them vaccinated uh, under 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 their own supervision that will be, will be wiser rather than refusing the vaccine so guys uh, so guys I have, uh, I have yeah umar just a few seconds okay uh, Uh, just to echo what Dr. Bushra just said, get vaccinated and become a vaccine ambassador. Uh, get others to vaccinate. If you have heard this session, you know, just spread the word. You know, spread real news rather than fake news, and get people to get vaccinated. Don't forget the people who work in your house, your house help, your staff, the people who work in your companies. Get them vaccinated because uh, it, everyone needs protection. Uh, so. If, if I would like to thank the Beacon House uh, School Systems for arranging this SOT events uh, regarding the controversies, confusions, and concerns of COVID-19 and its vaccinations. I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Faisal Mahmood, uh, who is currently the head of uh, Department of Infectious Disease at AKU, Farin Hali, uh, she's an infectious disease specialist and. currently heading the infectious disease department at NICVD Dr Bushra Jamil professor at AKU currently a lead person in NCOC and helping the government de design its policies 
and Omar Chukhtai, uh, who is heading the Chukhtai Labs. Thank you very much, Beacon House, and thank you all of you for being there. The key lesson or the key message is please get vaccinated. There are no conspiracy theories. And everybody, every child, every adult, everybody has a risk of getting COVID-19. It is not going away. The only way we can make a difference is making sure all our children, all of us, parents, servants, neighbors, they all get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Perfect.